Good morning. I'm a little bit discombobulated up here today. Um, if you understand that word, you know what kind of condition. Uh, I think we have to uh, break down the tables today, right? Okay. Now, Trish just said, don't anybody hug Gloria because she might get some germs and dawn is back. So, <laughs> you know. Can't hug Gloria. And, um, <laughs> you know, our church family is, uh, some of the members are going through tough times. And um, they know that they're kept in prayer, thought about, and just getting by like all of us do. And we have the uh, best message in the world. Like I said before, could you think of anything better to do in the winter of your years than preaching this message? So that makes me, that makes me very happy. A lot of people, when they, if they retire, they sit on the couch and they drop dead in six months or something. You know, this keeps you active. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. And I just pray that your understanding, your, your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding will work in the people that need it the most to give them some peace in their hearts and to understand deeper what your love, what your connection to us is once we get saved. It's unlike anything else in the world because it is supernatural. Amen. We're going to continue our hell series here. Um, hell is an immutable judgment. When man sinned, he became a candidate for the wrath of God, judgment, hell, and the lake of fire. In time past, this is a little review, Hell had two compartments, torments and paradise. Sometime after the death of Jesus Christ and the malefactor, the thief on the cross, the paradise section was moved up into the third heaven. We are like people living in a house with a fire in the basement. Some people are so rooted in their house and tangible things, you're going to have to pull them twice. Okay? They, they forget what is going to happen when... when these things, with these things upon death. They don't, they, they don't think past that. They, they want it right now, but does that really fulfill you? If you want something, you can't get it. Um, when I, I've told you before that growing up, I didn't even know what I needed, what I wanted, until I came to this message. I didn't know how to ask because I didn't know anything about it because you're just removed from all this kind of stuff here that's scripture. And if you're Catholic, you don't really read the Bible. So... Um, so the, the, the comfort you get from Scripture, the understanding and wisdom it gives you on the inside is something that I relish and I wish for everybody in the world if they, if they, if they want it. Um, Debbie and I got saved in the Right Division Church, but then we found, you know, Shorewood, and then we, we went on from there. So the issue of tangible things down here that they forget what is going to happen when these things upon death, the issue of the wrath of God ought to make you have a loose hold on your things down here on earth. In other words, you can't take it with you when you die. So in time past, you could, have, you could find saved people that went to hell in the paradise section. Okay? The issue today is faith in the blood. There is no other way to escape hell. There are many people now, there's, it goes around and around and pops up, that are talking about universal salvation. There, there's no hell, and, you know, everybody gets saved. You know how much death is talked about, hell, in, in the Bible? It's, it's, you might as well throw, throw away half the Bible. It's talking about, why would there be a judgment if, if there isn't no hell? Or why is there a hell if there's no judgment? Why is there a lake of fire if there's no judgment? Come on, get real. These people that talk about universal salvation. I wish it were that way, but God says for all those that believe. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth in godly, his faith is counted for righteousness. That verse, Romans 4 or 5, shows that faith is not a work. You believe. 
So, in Psalm three, Romans 3, 25, so we're t- talking about hell, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. We've been through these things now. The forbearance of God. Forbearance is simply the extension of time for the payment of a debt. How many people here use your credit cards? Do you pay the debt off every, every month? You leave it, leave it, you know? Try to. Try to, yeah. How does it feel when you don't have it paid off? Is there any other kind of feeling like this? Well, think about if somebody understands the fact that there is a hell and there's a heaven and there's a hell. There's no purgatory or limbo or anything like that, but there's a... What if they start understanding that? Do you think they have that feeling for not paying off their credit card at the end of the month? They should. Only the, the problem is with them is it's for eternity. It has a real location. It's a real thing. And you... Well, I won't go on. God Almighty in his forbearance passed over believers' sins in time past. God knew Calvary was coming. Now... Look at what the cross has done for us. You don't know what the cross did for Israel back in time past during the earthly ministry of Christ. This information and understanding came through Paul, Saul, Paul, who wrote half the New Testament. James, Cephas, and John acknowledged this. All other people in John acknowledged this, that Paul was the man. He received information from, from God. And they extended the right hand of fellowship. We went from the dispensation of the law to the dispensation of grace. What a difference. That is, by the way, how Debbie and I got saved, understanding law from grace. And it took me a couple of weeks longer because I'm very hard-headed. Um, so he says here, Romans 3.26, To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Does it say it's given as a free gift? Believeth. Is believing a work? Not according to God. Okay? I like your haircut. I just, just, just noticed it. <laughs> I lost about 10 pounds too. <laughs> he provided, now listen to this one, a sacrificial system in the past to teach the doctrine of forgiveness. If any of you ever been in a situation in life where somebody did something to you and you didn't, didn't like them anymore after that? Yeah, we have. Are we supposed to forgive? I would tell you, do the best you can. Sometimes, for me, the way I am, my forgiveness is, not, is to stop bothering them, to stay away. And, you know, that, that's a couple of people, that's as far as I could go. I won't, I won't hassle them. But notice in Hebrews 10, and the blessings of the new covenant, of this new covenant, the blessings of, of this are for the nation of Israel. Hebrews 10, 18 to 20. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. There will be a new and living way, not the old way. Look at, um, I think it's Luke They say Luke 16. Um, I think that's the wrong one. Hold on a second. I'll find it. I'm 
I'm not pick up the hold on. Let me group eighteen. Okay, Luke nine and Luke eighteen. Luke nine and Luke eighteen. I was having a senior frog foggy moment. A froggy moment. In Luke nine, verse one. And then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the, God, the kingdom of the God and to heal the sick. Verse, verse 6, dropped on there. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So they were preaching the gospel. What gospel was that? It wasn't the gospel of grace. And they were healing, okay? And was that, you know, what gospel? In, in Luke chapter 18, this is two years later now from Luke 9, so he sent his 12 disciples out, then went and preached the gospel of the kingdom. When you get to Luke 18, verse 31, it's two years later, and it's shortly before Christ goes to the cross, he says, Then he took unto him the 12 and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Okay? For they shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood everything? And they understood none of these things. So, they're out there preaching the gospel, and it wasn't the gospel that saves today. How much clearer could that be? Um, Hebrews 10, 18 to 20, it says, Now, where remission of these is, there is, no, there is no more offering for sin, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, okay? Through the flesh. The di difference is that now the way is open, not just to the earthly tabernacle, because that is not the issue. But it was the way is open into the heavenly places themselves. God knew the cross was coming. They didn't know. Once Christ died, he opened that way. So you had a lot of sins back in the Old Testament that you, he could cover over, but they, they weren't forgiven until Christ came and, and gave his sacrifice on the cross. Hebrews twelve eighteen, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. Now remember, I'm talking about hell. There is, it's, a real, it's a real location. It's a real thing. Hell gets enlarged the more people that go into it. And there's a lot of people out there that are thinking there's no hell, yet it says it all over the place. There's no judgment, universal salvation for everybody. And I'm not trying to you know, rain on your parade here. This is these, what's your final authority in your life? Is it going to be your own wisdom or is it going to be the Bible? And he was twelve twenty two. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Look at Hebrews chapter seven. Now, who were the law keepers? What tribe was the law keepers? Levi, the Levitical priesthood, right? In Hebrews chapter 7, look at verse 11. If there be perfection, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of Aaron. How you should have, this should be blinking on and off on your Bible. You should put a neon sign there, blinking on and off. Well, look at go back to verse chapter six, verse one. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Hebrew is, is one of the three transition books. Matthew was the first, 
get you from the Old Testament to the New. Um, Acts is the second one, get you from the dispensation of law to the dispensation of grace. And Hebrews gets you in the ages to come. So the last nine books of your Bible belong in the ages to come time period right here, and they won't be, f be fulfilled until after we are raptured or, or we die, after, you know, when we go to be with the Lord. Back to your outline. The earthly Mount Zion and the city of Jerusalem on the earth are a picture of a place out in the universe. Do you remember when we talked about Isaiah 14, 13, the mount of the congregation? That's where Satan says, I'm going to be like the most high God. In the sides of the north, that Lucifer said he was going to set his throne on. There is out in the universe a place that God Almighty has ordained. The real Mount Zion of which the earthly Mount Zion is a picture. Just like the tabernacle is a type of the things in the heavenly places, in Hebrews it says, you've not just come to the type, you people are now involved in the real thing, in the heavenlies, and to an innumerable company of angels. Now watch the next verse here, 1223. To the general assembly, assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, Notice he capitalizes judge. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. I want you to go to a couple chapters, passages here. Because this, go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now go to Colossians. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And look at verses 14 and 15. Colossians 1, 14. In whom... We are going to get redemption, or we have it? We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. See, when they were just covered by the law, or, you know, by the blood, it didn't forgive them. It passed over them. The, the importance of the cross, what it does, comes through Paul. You don't understand the full meaning of the cross until you come to Paul. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Okay? Go to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. You guys need, like, you need a little work here to wake up more. Acts chapter 13. And look up verse... Let me see here. Look at verse 33. Let me start at verse 30. Acts 13, verse, verse 30. I'm going to break into it. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. Who is that? Jesus. And he was seen many days of them, which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is writ also written in the second psalm, This day have I begotten thee. This day have I begotten thee. You don't have to go there, but I'll read you this verse. You want to write it down. It says the same thing about Israel. In Exodus 4, verse 22, it says, and thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So it's about Jesus Christ, but they're so close, you know, and when he's here with them. In Hebrews it says, You've not just come to the type, 
You people are now involved in the real thing in the heavenlies and to an innumerable company of angels. Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly, assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect. Up in the heaven, where God Almighty is, there are a group of spirits of, of, of just men made perfect. Those people were down in hell, in paradise, in time past. They were transferred from there to the heavenly because the way is now open because of the cross and their sins were completely taken care of. The debt is cleared and the way is opened for them. Now, if you go to, if you've been to other religions, do they give this clear understanding? This is comfort food, right? This is comfort. Do you get that with religion? No. No. They just keep on saying, like the Catholic Church, they, they crucify Christ every, every, every week or whatever it suits them. That which held them back in time past is done away with. They are now involved in the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. It's Paul talking. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, visions is something that you see. Revelations is something that you hear. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Now, this goes right back to Acts 13 and 14, when they stoned Paul. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, because they stoned him. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. For such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, you remember me talking about the six books that Paul wrote in the Acts time period? Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Romans. 2nd Corinthians and Romans were written in the Acts time, Acts 20 time period. Paul's meeting with Christ in the third heaven gave him the courage to go back into Lystra. If they, I think he died. To go back into Lystra again. It, it gave him some backbone. Remember me talking about when you get from to the, you go through the first six epistles, but when you get to Ephesians, the word gnosis. The word gnosis in, in the, the first few chapters of Paul's epistles means to know. But when you get to Ephesians, it's epinosis. You know this, now you know everything. Okay? I believe, I used to believe that we weren't going to hear these words until we got to heaven. But upon thinking about it, I think, these are the words that Paul gave them through Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. He gave them more information so they could use it in their lives. Um, why did he have to do that? Well, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let me read you verses 1 to 3. Think about gnosis and then epinosis. Verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now, we talk every week. I talk with somebody saying, saying they, they preached to this guy or they did, told the truth over here. And usually what happens is, is people get angry with you. So my first thing is that you must have told them the truth. Because Paul says, Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I told you the truth. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are, are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For one, while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, and are ye not carnal? They're being babies. They're not understanding. Paul had to hold off until he got to that point where he started talking. The, the revelations God gave him, he, he writes Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Unspeakable words, he says there, is an oxymoron. It's like deafening silence or jumbo shrimp, right? <laughs> Paul's meeting with Jesus Christ gave him the courage to go back into Lystra after being stoned. 
The information he was given at this time was not allowed to be shared because of what I just read you in 1 Corinthians 3 at this time. He starts revealing this information in Ephesians. He was given an abundance of revelations from God. Christ also gave him a thorn in the flesh to keep himself, to keep him humble. And he did it for a reason. It looks like Paul had eye, eye problems and things like this, you know. He said they were willing to give me their own eyes if they could. So in that back to your outline, so in Acts 20, where he wrote 2 Corinthians, that is where we see from hell to the heavenly realm. The people in the Pentecostal church in the Acts period, they were Hebrews, it was written to those saints, are a people involved in the heavenly Jerusalem. Those people had been associated up there with the spirits of just men made perfect. So those Old Testament saints from the little flock, the Jewish Pentecostal church, the next two, died, had been caught up and gone in, and now the way is clear. Now, I made a mistake here. Their, their bodies, take out the other things, will be resurrected at the beginning of the millennium. I don't know how I got those names, but, you know, we didn't prove it. So their, take out spirits, not their bodies. Their body, their spirits, okay, their, their bodies are going to be resurrected. You read about the first death, the first resurrection, and the second resurrection in, in Revelation. The first resurrection, as I'm talking about right here, the second resurrection is into hell, into the lake of fire. What we have established in, is that paradise section in hell, in the center of the earth, is no longer occupied. Today, when we talk about dying and go to hell, we're not talking about a choice between paradise and torments. There is only one place where the saved go when they die, the third heaven. Also today, people try to throw smoke screens around hell by arguing that you should say hell or Hades or, and so forth. Hell is the only word you need to use. That's it. In time past, David could go to hell and not burn in flames. Paradise was also called Abraham's bosom. It is called this because the earth was promised to Abraham. The following verse says it belongs to man. Psalm 115, verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. The earth was for Israel. There, the hope of the people in time past was in the earth, down in the center of the earth in Abraham's bosom cradled in the midst of blessings and things pertaining to Abraham. Now these people are in the third heaven, paradise. What about the saved Gentiles? Let me read you, go to 2 Corinthians 4. And let me read you from verse 16 to chapter 5, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Now remember, what I'm teaching is truth. I will put capitalize all those letters. Verse 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. There's a lot of people who were here before. I think I've done 11 funerals in the last 14 years. Their outward man perished, and they're, they're, in, they're in the third heaven. What, what a great, when you think of a lost loved one, you know, you know they're, in, they're in, in the Lord's arms. That's, that's comforting. For our light affliction, now, our light affliction, how many of you have something that hurts a lot on their body, their bodies all the time? What do you mean light affliction? What do you mean when your heart is broken? I mean, when you, got, you, have, you have trouble. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The anguish that you go through, the, the sufferings, the bitterness, and the, the, you know, it, it works for us for when we get up there. Well, we look not at the things which are seen, because God wants to pull us twice if you're hanging on to these things, but at the things which are not seen, but the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 5.1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, Eternal in the heavens. Eternal in the heavens. 
Verse 2 says, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon which are, with our house, which is from heaven. Do you clothe yourself with a house? You clothe your, yourself with clothes. Thank you very much for that, by all means. It would be... <laughs> Don't even want to think about it. But Paul says, like my wife was saying to him, only look at me in the front, night, not on the side, that's sideways. Okay. I said, same thing, you know. <laughs> I don't want to go further than that. I'll be divorced. Um, you clothe yourself with clothes. But Paul says it is a house. We are going to clothe ourselves with it. Your body is described as clothing for your soul. There is something you wear to dress it with, to cover it up. It is also described as a house, the place where your soul lives. You have a spirit, a soul, and a body, tripartite. Your soul has a bodily shape, and lives inside of your physical body. It's the vehicle that carries it along. It is not some nebulous thing the size of a golf ball stuck way back in the left ventricle of your heart. The clothes you, your soul wears is flesh, a body. But the next verse, in the next verse, Paul is saying he wants his resurrection body that God is going to give him from heaven. How many of you pine for that? <laughs> As you get older, old arthritis comes in and all these other aches and pains and all that. You know, I, I got such a pain in my, my left arm here that I, I got to go to the VA again. But I get, I'm getting old, or I am old, I should say, and uh, they don't like to do too many more surgeries on people my age. We'll see what happens. The, the operations I have had on there, it's, it's, it's helped me. Uh, get very, made my life better, more mobile. You know, so I can, you know, I'm, I'm glad for the, the uh, advances they've made in medicine. You know, instead of putting metal in you, put titanium. That doesn't rust. So I am thankful for that. In 2 Corinthians 5.3, Paul says, If so be that being clothed, we should not be found naked. Our eternal body is better than being down here in this body, isn't it? Look at verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. There are people that teach soul sleep, that you're asleep during this time. That's not what God's word says. To be present, that's an active verb. Be present. If your soul is naked now, is your soul naked now? No. Is your soul going to be naked in the resurrection? What Paul is talking about will be the time you die physically, get rid of the house you have now, and the time you get resurrected when you get your resurrection body. There is an intermediate state for the believer. That is what is described in the verses. What we're looking for is the rapture, right? We're looking for immortality without physical death. Go to 1 Corinthians 55. No, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. And you'll be able to see, these are company words, that we already have the victory. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, go to Philippians chapter 3. This is in the sense of the following passage. Philippians chapter 3. 
Let me read you verse 11 through 14. Philippians chapter 3, 11 through 14. It says, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to, re, to have apprehended, app, apprehended this, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Now, I have a very big problem with this. There's just some things you can't forget. Okay? I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You want to be going on an upward slope as you, as you learn and read scripture. In other words, you're understanding. You want the epino, epinosis, not just the gnosis. So you need to play the, the words in Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Oh, we need all the words. In 2 Corinthians, go back to 2 Corinthians 5. The one thing that happens when you start reading this and start assimilating these things, these little nuggets of knowledge, is wisdom from God's word, the first issue always is being what's your final authority. It's, it's your Bible. But look what he says in, in chapter 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. Now Ephesians 4 says we're sealed by the Spirit. Can you break the seal of God? No. Are there people that think you can? Yes. They're thinking the Catholic way. But this has the sense of working, if you go to Philippians chapter 2, In this way, Philippians 2, verse 12. It says, wherefore, my beloved, or by the way, he's writing to the Philippians. Are, is this church, are they, are, they, are they saved people? They're saved, right? Okay. Verse 12. Now, you've heard me do this before. Wherefore, my beloved, beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, the way this is translated in a religion says you have to work for your salvation. Well, Paul is saying, now that you're saved, grow in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Work out, now that you're saved, learn as much as you can. Work it out in your body. Every day, think about it. Don't half-step. Take the leap. Understand this. It's not working. You can't work to get saved or to stay saved or work to show you're saved. Three wrong Gospels. But you can work it out with the words in your life. If you're having problems and, and, you know, on the inside of your, your heart, and only you can see them. And that's when, the, that's when things like this, when they, when they mean, well, they should be important all of the time. The idea of dying and going to heaven, to walk down the streets of gold, fishing in the stream of life, Rick would like that, catching the rainbow trout, and all that kind of thing for eternity is a figment of somebody's imagination. We're going to float on a cloud and drink mint julep, right? Paul says, I don't want to die just to be in the intermediate state. I want to live here and work and serve the Lord in the heavenlies too. I don't want my soul to walk around without its house, without its clothes. What was Paul looking for? The rapture. What are we looking for? The rapture. Um, can anybody date the rapture? No. Religion has worked that around so that the reward is dying and going to heaven. The reward Paul, Paul talked about and groaned about was not just to die and be unclothed. This is your condition 
in the intermediate state. When the believer dies today, he is in a state where he does not have a physical body. His soul is without its body. You have a spirit, soul, and body. And you are not complete without all three. You can't exist without all three of them. If your soul and body are not together, that is physical death for your body. But that does not mean your soul quits existing. Sometimes, some call this a conditional immortality, soul sleep. We don't, we don't believe in that. Um, if you want to believe that, you're, you're free to do anything you want. I actually believe that, you know, to, it's an active verb. We're going to be with the Lord. We know it. We won't have our physical body. We're waiting for that, but it's, that's what I get from the verses. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. If Paul didn't believe what the Lord was saying, he wouldn't say something like this. He, wanted to, he would want to stay around and you know, do the work of the Lord, which he was doing most of his life. You can be absent from the body and still exist. The verb to be is a verb that denotes a state of being. When you're absent from the body, you are. You exist. Present with the Lord. You can be without your body and still exist. Now, when you die, or your loved one dies in the Lord, there's a lot of loved ones that have died here in this church, as small as it is. The thing that makes a difference in the church is the people who come, they want this information. You don't need to have numbers that beat everybody else. It's, uh, and you'll learn that. When you die, now when you die, your loved one dies in the Lord, their soul goes to be with God in the third heaven. But that isn't the end of the thing. This is the point. You still exist. What you are looking at, what you are looking for is that resurrection. That is our hope. Go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. So the hope is you're going to be with Jesus, united with him, and given a body that can function just like his body. He has a place in the ministry for you in the heavenly places for eternity. Look at Titus chapter 2. Let me start with verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. Now some people who don't believe in hell use this verse. Universal salvation. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Here we go. 13 is a good number for us. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Christ Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority that no man despise thee. When we understand this, the blessed hope, when you understand that Life is not going to be painful if you're saved. It's going to change when you die, when we die. And 
we will be giving some kind of work, depending on our, our capacity of understanding, and nobody should stand up here and judge anybody else. Depending on you know, what you've learned inside you, you'll be given a position of you know, working for the Lord. There's going to be a couple of different things that you won't be used to, but I'll just read about that in a second. This is their hope. It is a glorious assurance that you are going to depart and be with Jesus Christ. That is 2.13. But the hope is that you are going to be united with him and given a body that can function just like his body. He has a place and a ministry for you in the heavenly places for eternity. You will function there for his glory. That's why I always stretch, any set, stress, um, anything we do, right, the glory goes to God. When you throw in a religion, they can look at all the works they've done and compare it. We don't do that. We try not to do that. Let's put it that way. You will function for his glory. What a great hope. Don't miss what your hope is. What is our hope? What does verse 13 say? A confident and joyful expectation of a future certainty. We know it's sure. It's just not when Paul, the word, how can I put this? A promise is it's a, sometimes, no, I don't want to go there. Yeah. Back to your outline. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. You know how hard that can be at times? When you start teaching this to other, pe other saved people, and it just reaffirms what I've learned is that if you start speaking the truth, we know here, to other Christians, I would say 99% of them get angry with you. So when we deal with people that, that are new, and then they get yelled at after this, you know what I mean? I said, well, you must be saying the truth, because this is what happened to Paul all, all over the place. He says, all those in Asia are, are, you know, are against him. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Paul said, if I have a choice, I would rather be there than here. I know that as long as I am here, I'm not with God. My choice, I want to live with God in heaven. And this thought right there is never, you never find in the scriptures until you come to Paul. How big of a contrast is that? You get all these chapters, and you got 13 books by Paul. Small book. And it says it right there. And that's why the number 13 is a good number for us. Think about your eternal body. My brother who's dead now, he, he was a pilot. I, I drove him to his first solo. I got $2 out of him for gas. And he had his pilot's license before he had his driver's license. He was a year older than me. And then, you know, he, my other, like my other brother, all three of us went in the service. When he got out of the service, he did the flying. He was, you know, he only got to up to a certain level, but he never got beyond that. But when he was real sick, I said before, it took me 20 years to get my siblings to understand this. He was one of the first that understood this. And we never got along too well until that time. And I thought, what kind of a body did Jesus Christ have? I think I'm going to mention this in my next sermon. He had a body that could go trillions of miles, trillions of years, you know, to see the amount of the congregation. He could go through space. He didn't need a spacesuit, a helmet, or a rocket ship. He could go there, and can, he, he, I'll tell you next, next session, but he, he went up there in two hours. They said, you can't hold me because I have a descendant of my father. But in about two hours, he came back, and they could hold him. How can you go to the, you know, trillions of miles away in two hours and come back in two hours? 
How long would it take to get to, to Mars? You know what I mean? Just think about that. You don't need a space suit. This is something that's probably a new dimension or something. I mean, it took the Gabriel 21 days, three weeks to get down to Daniel because he was being you know, opposed by Satan and his cohorts. But going up there, coming down like that, two hours, that's incomprehensible to the human mind. Philippians 1, verses 21 to 23. This is why Paul says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, just like us having the desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. We are looking for mortality to be swallowed up in life. Philippians 1, 25. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant than Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. What do I do here every week? I come every week. You like that, right? I like it. I mean, I can identify with this. I like coming here. Sunday used to be the worst day of my week. Now it's the best day of my week. I didn't like Sundays because we had to go to Catholic Church. And I used to throw up there, so they, they didn't sit around me anymore. <laughs> so that was a good thing. Yeah, I was, I, you know, those close people, I, I barfed on the floor a few times. And they just can't, you know, I go there, nobody's sitting around me. Okay, that's the way I like it. Okay. Paul knew that God valued and esteemed him on the earth to function and operate in his capacity. Now, we all got weak points on, you know, strong points, you know, in our, you know, in, so that's it is. So I'll say the last few words here. Therefore, save people today, go to the third heaven to be with the Lord present with the Lord. In time past, they went into the paradise. They went into paradise in the center of the earth, hell, when they died. They were kept in comfort and quietness until after Calvary, when the entrance into the third heaven was made by the cross. Now you and I, the saints today who die as members of the church of the body of Christ, go there to the third heaven to be with the Lord. And I say, thank you, Lord, for this, and I'm waiting for it. Amen.